Exploring Idaho, the television adventure showcasing our state's unique people and places is brought to you by Albertsons, Southwest Airlines, the Idaho Department of Commerce, seven regional travel committees, and KTVB Channel 7. This edition of Exploring Idaho. Take a trip back in time to a turn of the century homestead located in the remote Hell's Canyon. Also, we'll learn more about what's being done to save rare and endangered birds of prey at a research facility near Boise. we'll meet American folk artist Jane Wooster Scott. She's capturing Boise on canvas. All this coming up on Exploring Idaho. And welcome to another edition of Exploring Idaho. Have you ever wondered how Idaho's Hell's Canyon got its name? Well, if you could talk to the people who settled there, they'd probably give you plenty of reasons. But the fact remains, they settled in Hell's Canyon and found their own piece of heaven in this remote region located along the Snake River in north central Idaho. The steep, rocky walls of Hell's Canyon are spectacular. The rugged landscape has been shaped by time and the turbulent waters of the Snake River, and now in some places, it's the deepest river gorge in North America. The first humans eventually entered this area thousands of years ago. These ancestors to the Native Americans left few clues about their life here, and today Forest Service archaeologists are trying to find out where these people came from and how they survived in this remote canyon. This is a place where people could come in the winter, doesn't snow often, it's a wintering area for big game. The river had abundant fish runs, the fish ran up these tributary streams. It just has everything going for it in terms of a place to be. Uh, what we're looking at here are the remnants of a semi-subterranean house or a, a pit house and, and these large depressions were at one time covered with a conical framework of poles and, and hides. They were communal dwellings occupied by an extended family, and they generally date, say, between 3,000 and 1,600 years ago. Virtually every flat spot in Hell's Canyon has something going on on it. It's either a prehistoric site or a historic site. In more recent history, homesteads were established in the canyon during the early 1900s. They tried to scratch out an existence here, raising cattle or sheep near the more gentle benches along the river. By about 1890 or 1900, there are 150 families living in Hell's Canyon. There's a couple of hard winters, I think around uh, 1915, 1916, and by 1920, only 5% of those homesteaders are still here. So that gives you an idea how difficult it is. The government bet you 160 acres that you couldn't make it in Hell's Canyon, and by and large, they turned out to be right. But Kirkwood Ranch was one of the few homesteads which was successful, and it remains in the canyon today. Now it's managed and preserved by the U.S. Forest Service. It's a great example of the rich heritage which can be found in the canyon. The ranch started with a small cabin built here in 1885 by Dr. J. Kirkwood from Grangeville. After a number of other owners, it was patented as a homestead in 1909. 
Then in 1920, this two-story white frame house was built. All the material and supplies had to be either brought in on horseback or by a difficult boat trip. In the early 30s, at the height of the Depression, Len Jordan and his wife Grace and their three children came to Kirkwood to run a sheep ranch. Just imagine the hardship of daily life in the canyon. With limited access to supplies, nearly everything had to be made. For Grace, many hours were spent in the kitchen, cooking meals for a hungry family and the hired help. There was wood to chop, canning, soap making, and sewing to do. Miles of mountainous terrain separated you from your nearest neighbor. It was not uncommon to go months without seeing another person. Nearly 10 years of hard work in the canyon prepared Lynn Jordan for his next undertaking. You see, after leaving Kirkwood, he went on to become governor of Idaho and later a U.S. senator. Well, there's a lot of history here, and as caretaker for the ranch, Don James looks after the numerous structures and artifacts. This is Hannah Cabin, which was moved here by Lynn Jordan. It was built about 1912, and it's been used as blacksmith shop. Then inside we have the artifacts of the old blacksmith trade. On the rafters you see uh, mule shoes, horseshoes of various kinds. You couldn't go to the hardware store and buy what you wanted. You, you put it together here, you build it. You took care of things yourself. This uh, was an active sheep ranch in the Depression times. Uh, people didn't have much money. They lived here, uh, raised sheep, and it was more of an existence. Originally, the Hannah Cabin was located a short way up Kirkwood Creek near the Carter Mansion. The mansion is really an elaborate log cabin, which was built here in the 1920s by a man named Dick Carter. Okay, we're in the front room of Dick Carter's house. Uh, what you'll notice, and, and you'll rarely ever see in any log cabin, is lath and plaster interior. And you can see the, the lath exposed up here in the ceiling. Uh, take a look, you've got picture boards and kickboards, uh, wooden floors. The detail uh, is incredible. It, it just, to me, it's amazing. It, it makes you really wonder what this guy must have been like to want to do this in a place like this. He came in here and, and just through sheer effort built one of the nicest log structures in all of Hell's Canyon. For all his effort, Dick Carter didn't get to spend a lot of time in his fancy cabin. A moonshiner during Prohibition, he was later arrested and sent to jail. Ace Barton knows all about the Carter Mansion and many other Hell's Canyon stories. Ace, a third generation homesteader in the canyon, recalls what life was like here. It was tiresome work, but uh, it was good work. I mean, it was all outdoors, that was the main thing. Everything you'd done, I guess, was a hard way, but if we didn't know any better, why well, it didn't seem all that hard. There was all kinds of, at that time, all kinds of wild game and uh, plenty of everything. I liked the solitude of it, sun hitting the peaks, you know, in the, in the early morning and the smell of the moisture off of the river. You can look a hundred times at that hillside over there. You'll see something different that you hadn't noticed before. Maybe it's just the way the light is or something. It makes you appreciate nature a little better, I think, to see how it operates. Hell's Canyon is a special place for the hardy breed of men and women who made this wilderness a home. And though most are now gone, if you listen in the quiet solitude, you can still share a moment in time with those who came this way before. And besides all the history, there are many recreational opportunities available too. Hiking, rafting, and fishing are all very popular in the canyon. We'll be right back. Still to come, endangered birds of prey. Here in Idaho, there's a group of people with fascinating jobs. They're consumed with the incredible task of saving endangered birds of prey. See what's being done as we visit this world-famous research headquarters just outside the capital city of Boise. 
High on a hill overlooking Boise is the Peregrine Fund World Center for the Birds of Prey. It is a unique research facility and species bank for rare birds from all over the world. Now in its 10th year at this location, the center has recently expanded. The Velma Morrison Interpretive Center was designed to handle the increasing number of visitors who want to learn more about birds of prey. She uses that hook beak to tear meat once she's caught her prey. Behind the scenes, the main focus of this facility is research. The ongoing recovery efforts here are part of a program that was started over 20 years ago when it was discovered that the peregrine falcon was being threatened by the pesticide DDT. Dr. Tom Cade loved this unique bird too much to let it disappear. It's the form and the function, the way it flies. When it dives, it achieves uh, speeds uh, well in excess of 100 miles an hour. And in those dives, or stoops as they're called, it gains the momentum uh, to pull out and then overtake any quarry in the air. And so it's just a very uh, spectacular aerobatic performance that people enjoy watching. Out of his desire to save this superb winged hunter, the Peregrine Fund was born. Techniques of captive breeding and monitored releases were developed over the years, and now the falcons once again soar in increasing numbers over much of the United States. Nearly half of the peregrines produced at the World Center are a result of artificial insemination. Cal Sanford, a propagation specialist for the center, collects semen from a male peregrine falcon. The bird is trained to release his sperm on a specially constructed hat. Once we get the semen from the bird, we collect it in a capillary tube. Now we've got a uh, large quantity of relatively high quality semen to do an artificial insemination on a non-breeding female. The fertilized eggs are collected from the nest after seven days of natural incubation. Okay, after we remove the eggs from the incubating adults, we bring them into the incubation room. We place them in the incubators. They'll be incubated for approximately 31 and a half days. And hopefully if all goes well, then the egg will pip. Cal's efforts are rewarded and now he has two hungry mouths to feed every few hours. In only 45 days, these two young peregrines will be fully feathered and ready for their new home in the wild. So once we had success with the peregrine and saw that these procedures would work uh, for a number of birds of prey, we developed a number of recovery programs that are designed along the same lines as the peregrine, that is to breed birds in captivity and release them into the wild. The knowledge gained from the success of this program is being used to help some of the world's rarest and most endangered birds. With the help of a sophisticated monitoring system, biologists are able to closely observe activities in the holding pens without disturbing the birds. This pair of California condors look like they're fighting a little bit. Of the many species gathered here, the California condor is one of the rarest. A decade ago, there were only 22 of these majestic birds left in the world. Today, there are nearly 81 condors, only a few in the wild and the rest in captive breeding programs. Of the six pairs of California condors, none of them are breeding age yet. We do have the more common Andean condor pair here, which produces eggs. We take that egg and we gain experience on incubation and rearing of young with that more common species so that we can apply that knowledge to the endangered California condor once we receive eggs from those birds. The harpy eagle is one of the world's largest eagles. Found in the tropical forest of South America, its numbers are on the decline. Habitat destruction is thought to be the main cause. Along with the captive breeding program, worldwide conservation efforts are being attempted in the wild. We're uh, working in Africa, in uh, Kenya, uh, in Zimbabwe, in Madagascar. One of our uh, biologists found uh, a species of bird of prey in uh, Madagascar, the Madagascar serpent eagle, that hadn't been seen in 64 years. If the Peregrine Fund hadn't been in Madagascar working, it's possible that that species could have been totally lost. Uh, now we have an opportunity, a chance to save it. One of the greatest concerns facing man today is the loss of the rich diversity of life that exists in the world. An incredible group of biologists and others who have a special love for these birds 
have dedicated their lives to meeting the challenge. Birds of prey are uh, a rather romantic species of uh, wildlife. Many of them exist in the most remote places and the most spectacular places, such as the highest cliffs. They're not dominated really by anything, even to include gravity in that they can fly. They uh, are the embodiment of many things that humans value. Uh, courage, uh, freedom, um, you know, they're uh, a rather incredible group of birds. If you're interested in seeing falcons and eagles in the wild, the Snake River Canyon southwest of Boise is the perfect place to observe a wide variety of birds of prey. We'll be right back. Up next, the American folk art of Jane Wooster Scott. Governor Andrus is fond of saying Idaho is what America was. It's a big reason a lot of us live here. Jane Wooster Scott, the artist featured in this book, paints America the way America was. So it's only fitting she has chosen to live in Idaho. It's also fitting she's now capturing Boise in her much-loved style. The past few months, she's been scouting out the city with Malia Hall of Boise's Gallery 601, which commissioned the soon-to-be-released work. There's a fisherman down there right now, I see. Let's get a picture of him. He'll be in the painting, we know that. That's great, look at him. Collectors in Boise and around the world are looking forward to this latest painting, so we thought this would be a good time to get to know Jane Wooster Scott better. Oh, I like this one. Thank you. Is this any place in particular? No, this exists only in my imagination. Mm. It'd be a nice place to go. It would be nice. Wouldn't you like to be there? I mean, oh. it's a happy place. Jane Wooster Scott lives in this Sun Valley home and in the paintings she creates here. It's very hard to have too many cares and too many worries in your life when you're painting such very happy, serene scenes. And I do get somewhat transported right into the canvas. I'm thinking about what those people were doing, what they were wearing, you know, their way of life. And it, um, it takes me right with them. Her paintings of America's celebrations of life, traditions, and values seem to strike a chord in people of all cultures. The world is discovering Jane Wooster Scott. But this very successful career had very humble beginnings. It just kind of happened when she decided to copy a Grandma Moses painting for a friend's housewarming present. She had never painted before, but she loved it. And before long, she had developed her own style of American folk painting. Then one day, a famous friend made a fateful offer. I have a friend, Jonathan Winters, who is a very well-known comedian. And uh, he is a very fine artist and, uh, and has studied art for years. And he was having his first show in Los Angeles. Uh, and he did not have enough paintings to, uh, to cover the walls of this very large gallery. So he said, come on, Jane, show yours with me. I said, Jonathan, you are out of your mind. I said, nobody is going to buy my stuff. Anyway, he twisted my arm. And we opening night, I had, I think, 40 canvases in there, and every one of them sold within the first, I'd say, 45 minutes. Much to my shock. <laughs> now, 20 years later, she finds herself in demand, and commissioned work like The City of Trees, the much-awaited painting of Boise, is the subject of excitement among her fans. There's a great energy in Boise, and I, I think maybe due to the fact that it's growing so rapidly, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know, but you feel that growth, you feel the energy, you see kids on the street playing and everything, which I don't see very many places in, in the world anymore. But you'll see it in her Boise painting, and that's not all. You'll see the Boise people love to brag about to their out-of-town friends. And of course the river, you know, I, I love the fact that the river runs through your city. It absolutely knocks me out. I think, uh, I think it's probably the only city that has a river that goes from end to end like that. So I wanted to focus all the attention with the fishermen and the biking and the kids running all over and the rafting and all that. So uh, this is going to be filled with a lot of activity and everything when it's finished. And old architecture, still so much a part of Boise, also thrills this artist. 
turn of the century buildings and landmarks with lots of history and memories for the people who live near them. I take a bit of an artistic license in moving everything around. <laughs> I never hesitate to move a mountain or move a building or whatever it may be, whatever works. <laughs> I think it's called definitely artistic license. Yeah. This old guy's going to be singing his heart out there. I think we have enough unhappiness in the world. We don't need it in our paintings. Um, I really feel it's very important to have happy things surrounding you, and that's what I try very hard to impart of, uh, of bringing happiness to canvas, that when you look at it, you kind of get a lift and say, gee, that was nice. I'd like to be there. If you'd like to know more about the Boise painting or see it for yourself, contact Gallery 601 in Boise. And grab a pencil because I'll be giving you details on how to find out more about our other stories today and how to get your own VHS copy of Exploring Idaho, the best stories of our past season. Here's how you can get more information on the stories you've just seen on Exploring Idaho. Call 1-800-635-7820 and ask for the field notes on show number 112. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Exploring Idaho. As we say goodbye, we want to take one more minute to show you even more of the splendors of springtime in Boise. Nature is bursting with beauty this time of year. What kind of world will they inherit? Will it be one of uncertainty or one of promise? At KTVB and NBC News, we're digging deeper to give you no-nonsense news and the answers you depend on. That's why more and more people in Idaho are turning to Channel 7, and that's why you should too. NBC News and News Center 7, now more than ever.